Xin lỗi mời quái Mr. Speaker, sir, this question I've originally Mr. directed... Mr. Yeoman, why you're supposed to pose a question, allow the office holder to respond? Thank you. No, but I can uh, talk about more context of the question. No. I've actually posted a question to the senior There's minister. There's a parliamentary question to be posted. There's a response. You have a supplementary question. You can post after yes, that. Thank you. Yes, I understand. You. Your office have decided that, right? So, okay. Uh, the Mr. Yeoman, why? Can you please sit down? Allow them to respond, please. Thank you. Question two, please. Mr. Speaker, sir, with your permission. Mr. Minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, with your permission, I'll also deal with the question that has been asked by Mr. Leon Pereira, which is scheduled for a subsequent sitting. Please proceed. On the same topic. A general approach is that law enforcement agencies do not disclose the names of individuals who have been or are being investigated. This general principle is subject to exceptions. One example where names have been disclosed is where the offender has absconded or left the jurisdiction while investigations are ongoing. For example, members may recall the case relating to P. P. Jiaping and Pansuk Sri Vipa. The couple was involved in a series of alleged cheating cases involving luxury goods they fled Singapore last year in 2022 while investigations were ongoing. <clears throat> the police released their details. A second example would be where the facts which constitute the alleged offences uh, and the individuals who may have committed the alleged offences are already publicly known. For example, as a result of findings made by our courts, and there is some public interest in disclosing that investigations are underway. Such disclosure has to be weighed against possible prejudice to the individuals concerned. A case in point would be where following the judgment of the High Court in the party Liani case in 2020, police commenced investigations against her employer's son, Carl Liu, based on the High Court's observations that he had given dishonest evidence under oath. I informed this House of those investigations during the debates relating to the case. However, this does not mean that police will automatically publish the names of the individuals under investigations if their names had been made public in other earlier proceedings. The context in which the names had been published in the other proceedings, the nature of those proceedings, the nature of the offenses being investigated, and the connection of the offences under investigation to the original proceedings, and whether the agencies have taken the view that subsequent criminal proceedings are or are not possible, all of these are relevant. An assessment of all the facts and the context has to be made in considering the public interest as to whether to disclose the names. Yet another type of example where names have been published is the case of Chu Eng Han, he had been convicted of several offenses. He was then arrested when attempting to flee Singapore. Police made public the arrest on the day he and his accomplices were arrested and their identities were released. After investigations, Chu and one accomplice were charged. A fourth example relates to Alex Jung. Alex Jung stated publicly that his passport had been impounded in respect of some conduct. Police then issued a media statement explaining that Jung was assisting the police but had not been arrested. A fifth example would be where police are investigating a case and there is a lot of misinformation. Police might then make public the accurate facts relating to the case to dispel the falsehoods, and we have done that in the past. As can be seen, there are a wide variety of situations where it may become necessary to make public the fact that a person is under investigation or has been arrested or is assisting in investigations. We have to assess the facts and the public interest involved. 
the circumstances relating to Mr. Lee Sin Young and Mrs. Lee Swet Fun straddle the first two examples that I mentioned. The discussions surrounding number 38 Oxley Road are of significant public interest. One might say they are of at least as much interest as in the case of Party Liani, if the two can even be compared. The Oxley Road matter was debated extensively in this House following ministerial statements on the subject. The findings by the disciplinary tribunal and the court of three judges in the disciplinary proceedings against Mrs. Lee Swet Fun and their findings on Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swet Fun are matters of public record. Both the disciplinary tribunal and the court of three judges found that Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swet Fun had lied under oath. And let me remind members of what both tribunals said. The court of three judges said that Mrs. Lee Swet Fun lied under oath, and I quote, we agree with and affirm the DT, that's a disciplinary tribunal's finding, that Mr. Lee Sien Young was not telling the truth when he said that he was the one who had forwarded the draft last will to the respondent. For the same reasons, we also agree with and affirm the DT's findings that the respondent's evidence on this issue, which I quote, Mr. Lee Sien Young's was similarly untrue and to be rejected. The respondent also claimed in her AEIC that after she received the draft last will from Mr. Lee Sien Young, she did not even open it. We agree with the DT that it's implausible and ultimately incredible. We note that after the disciplinary proceedings were initiated, the respondent adopted the position which the DT rejected and which we too have rejected as false. The respondent did act with a degree of dishonesty in the disciplinary proceedings. Mr. Lee Sien Young lied under oath. Mr. Lee Sien Young was not telling the truth. If you go to the, what the disciplinary tribunal said at various parts, in essence, an elaborate edifice of lies was presented both on oath through Mr. Lee Sien Young and the respondent's affidavits and on the witness stand and through their public and other statements which were referred to or relied upon during the disciplinary proceedings. The affidavits were contrived to present a false picture. Several of the lies were quite blatant. Considered in totality, the respondent's conduct was quite dishonest. Mr. Lee Sien Young's and her conduct demonstrated a calculated attempt to ensure that Mr. Lee executed the last will as quickly as possible without due regard to Mr. Lee's wishes and hide their wrongdoing in having done so. Having procured the last will through these improper means, she and Mr. Lee Sien Young then fabricated a series of lies and inaccuracies to perpetuate the falsehood that Mrs. Kwa Kim Lee had been involved in the last will and hide their own role in getting Mr. Lee to sign the last will and their wrongdoings. Mr. Lee Sien Young and the respondent tried to explain away their conduct the explanations range from the improbable to the patently contrived to the downright dishonest. The respondent was a deceitful witness. Before us, she lied or became evasive whenever she thought it was to her benefit to lie or evade. Mr. Lee Sien Young's conduct was equally deceitful. He lied to the public, he lied to the ministerial committee, and he lied to us. He had no qualms about making up evidence as he went along. We found him to be cynical about telling the truth. In plain language, the effect of what they said is this. Mr. Lee Sien Young may make untrue statements in public and in private whenever there is no legal penalty for telling untruths. His public and private statements cannot be relied upon to be accurate. We do not find the explanations credible. Mr. Lee Sien Young's explanations for the untruths in his posts were not credible. Mr. Lee Sien Young knew the true facts. He admitted that some of his statements were inaccurate. Mr. Lee Sien Young lied to the public about how the last will was drafted. He admitted to us that some of his statements were inaccurate. He said his public statements could be inaccurate because they are not sworn statements, and thus he may not look at them carefully. This, that was dishonest. The disciplinary tribunal, in essence, said that Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swet Fern had combined to mislead and cheat the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. 
Police investigations were commenced based on the findings of the disciplinary tribunal and the court of three judges. Police did not make at that time, did not make public at that time in October 2021 that the couple was being investigated. A question was asked in this house earlier this month about some public statements which had been made relating to Oxley and the judgments of the disciplinary tribunal and the court of three judges. Members can look up the question and answer. The question required discussing the accuracy of those public statements in the context of the judgments of the disciplinary tribunal and the court of three judges. And it required dealing with the honesty or otherwise of Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swetford that there were ongoing police investigations arising from the findings of the tribunal and the court of three judges was in that context relevant and necessary to be disclosed to give an accurate and full answer. It was also accurate and to give a complete answer to mention that Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swetford had not cooperated with the police investigations after saying that they would the reasons for disclosing that Mr. Lee Sin Young and Mrs. Lee Swetfern were under investigation are broadly similar to the reasons why it was disclosed that Mr. Carl Liu was being investigated for perjury, except that in the case of Mr. Lee Sin Young and Mrs. Lee Swetfern, they have in addition absconded from jurisdiction. In Mr. Carl Liu's case, we were discussing his conduct and the conduct of other family members and the court's findings in this house. We thought it necessary to disclose in that context that Mr. Carl Liu was being investigated. He cooperated with the investigation. He has since been charged. Some members may also recall that I had said in this house when we were discussing the Party Liani case that if any judgment or decision issued in the course of any legal proceedings contains findings that there may have been perjury or other serious offenses, that is something that we will take seriously. We mean what we say. I do not recall any member expressing a different view that such lying on oath in court proceedings should not be taken seriously. That was the situation with Mr. Carl Liu, and that is the situation with Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swet Fun. But as I said with the added fact that they have also absconded. To summarize, the disciplinary tribunal and the court of three judges had said Mr. Lee Sin Young and Mrs. Lee Swetfern were lying. They had been found to be dishonest and more. All of that is public. They have also essentially absconded from jurisdiction. We take this seriously. And those facts were disclosed so that this House can have a full and complete picture when a question had been asked which related to their conduct. If we cannot or should not answer the question in part or full, then we would have said so. In deciding whether we make public that investigations are ongoing, one factor which is considered is prejudice to the person being investigated. If the investigations show that the person is innocent, or an assessment is made that his guilt cannot be established in court, and if his name had been publicized earlier, a cloud would have hung over him until he was cleared. Thus, the general position is that names are not disclosed. Whether names should be re released in a particular situation is a matter of judgment on what public interest requires. The examples I gave earlier illustrate the exceptions when names were made public. For example, if you take the case of Mr. Carl Liu, what is the prejudice to him? In Mr. Carl Liu's case, the High Court had said, taken the view that he was not telling the truth. The prejudice to him in disclosing that he was under investigations for that finding of lying is marginal, if any, and has to be weighed against the public interest at stake in disclosing the facts when the matter is being discussed in Parliament. Same applies to Mr. Lee Sin Young and Mrs. Lee Swet Fun. Members who are not lawyers may not know this, but when a disciplinary tribunal says 
that a person is guilty, it can only do so if it is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt on the guilt. Likewise, the court of three judges in disciplinary proceedings. The statements in Parliament about Mr. Lee Sien Yang and Mrs. Lee Swetfern do not materially add to any clout the couple may already be under based on what the tribunal and the court of three judges have said. If the facts are different, then the position will be different. For example, say a name had been published in other proceedings and the court had made some findings. But if our agencies are not able to prosecute the individual based on earlier court findings, because they assess that despite the earlier court findings, substantial new facts have to be proven and that relevant evidence is not available and that relevant witnesses are not available, then there can be arguments both ways on disclosure and an assessment has to be made on the specific facts and a judgment has to be made. But the cases of Mr. Liu and the Lees are quite different. And as I, I have said, in the case of the Lees, they have also absconded. I can tell members that there is another case where the highest court has made observations that a couple of persons had lied on oath. That matter is also being investigated. If there is a relevant question or issue about that matter, I can see that we will also set out the facts and say that police are investigating. But just like with Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swet Fun, initially when investigations have first commenced, police have not volunteered the information. But police will respond with the facts if there is a need to, for example, if questions are raised in parliament. Mr. Lee Sien Young and Mrs. Lee Swetburn will have every right to provide explanations on the matters being investigated if they eventually decide to do the right thing and cooperate with the police. It is their choice whether they want to be fugitives from justice or whether they come and explain why they say the courts were wrong to say that they had lied. The case of Keppel Offshore Marine Limited is quite different. It does not fall within the different examples I've set out. Members may not know this, but it was KOM which had made the CPIB report. The CPIB had conducted as thorough an investigation as it could with the information and powers that it possessed. It turned all the stones it could and assessed the evidence together with AGC. They concluded that they could not sustain any charges in court. The conduct had taken place overseas. Key witnesses are not available. Key documents are also not available. We got some information from Brazil, but it was not adequate to mount any criminal charge. There were no admissions which could be relied upon to cross the evidentiary requirements. The documents between the US authorities and KOM and the DPA also do not meet the evidentiary requirements. They go some way, but they don't cross the threshold in respect of those who are being investigated. The CPIB, for good reasons, has the reputation for being able to ferret out the truth. But even the CPIB can't get something out or proceed with charges when there are no documents or other evidence which cross the evidential threshold and which can be used to break down the interviewee's defenses. In these circumstances, the general policy of not disclosing the names of individuals who have been under investigation applies. However, if any member feels that this general policy should be changed and that law enforcement agencies should name all individuals who are being investigated, regardless of the circumstances, and even if they are not abscondees from jurisdiction, and even if no charges are likely to be brought in the end, that please let me know and we can debate that. I would be surprised if anyone says that. If everyone agrees that persons under investigations should in general not be named, then the only question is the circumstances under which, nevertheless, names will be disclosed. And I have explained some examples of when names have been disclosed. The fact that no one raised any issues with Mr. Liu being named or when the names of the other abscondees had been disclosed, shows that no one in this house took issue with this disclosure.
Thank you, sir. Mr. Leong. Speaker, I thank the Minister for the explanation. I have uh, uh, three SQ. Uh, can you ask. keep it to two SQ so the others can ask as well? I'll come back okay. to you if there's time. Yeah. Well, the issue here is really about fairness before the law, whether we have the rule of law in Singapore or not. The Minister has shared that some of the exceptions involve the offender having absconded or abs absconded. Uh, may I ask the first question then? Did the police specifically issue a written order for Mr. Lee Sien Yang and Ms. Lim Shek Fen to attend to the investigation at the police station. Secondly, he mentioned the difference between uh, the KOM case and this case. Um, but is it the KOM, KOM case also a matter of very wide public interest? A lot of people are very interested in in uh, the, the names of the six individuals. And I do not understand the uh, legal process very well, but under the, st let the stern warning letter, is there a paragraph that say that these six individuals of the KOM are guilty, but the prosecutor decided, or the CPI CM, uh, CPIB decided not to pursue the case because of some other reasons. So we have a situation here that for the KOM case, actually it's a more serious case. They are actually guilty. And we have the names in the, in the, in the foreign uh, jurisdiction documents or that already, actually. This one point. Second point is that the KOM case is actually of deep public interest. So why is there a double standard. Thank you. So, I took some care to explain the difference between the KOM case and the case of Mr. Liu and the Lees. As I understand the member, he says that, well, the KOM case is a case of public interest. People are interested to know the names. So why is there a double standard? Did the member listen to the explanation on the difference between the KOM case and the case of the Lees and Mr. Liu? Perhaps the member can go into a little bit of detail based on the explanation I've given on the differences and tell us which part of the explanation he disagrees before he alleges double standards. Get to the facts. I have set out what the differences are. So tell me which part you don't understand or you disagree with. And on his first question, did police issue a written order they were given an email. They promised that they will come and uh, agree, give an interview. They then left the jurisdiction, and they have said both to the police and in public that they will not cooperate with the police. They will not even come back into the jurisdiction. I think that is why I said they are essentially abscondists from justice. But for the record, I have made it very clear why the disclosure here is consistent with the disclosure in the Carl Lewis case. And you, sir, through you, I would also like to ask Mr. Leong, if Mr. Leong didn't see any problem when Mr. Liu's name was mentioned in similar circumstances, in fact, he took part in the debate and wanted a commission of inquiry why this extraordinary concern suddenly about the lease that he didn't show for Mr. Liu? And perhaps he can explain why his approach shows double standards. Mr. Leong. Minister, there you go again. 
I ask you a question, and you Mr. frame Leon. it in Mr. a different Leon. context. You can address it, Shubhi. Yes. Lower the temperature. Yes, Thank he, you. he addressed it in a different context and then asked me a question. But can you answer my question first? Did, you, did the police issue a written order to Mr. Lee Sen Yang and Ms. Lim Shafen? Sir, I answered Minister. the question. I understand. On email, okay. Mr. Leon Pereira. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I thank the Minister for his reply. Uh, just one SQ on the general principle uh, behind you know, when these disclosures of ongoing investigations are made. You know, when the government decides that it is in the public interest to make a disclosure about an ongoing investigation, what are the safeguards put in place to make sure that that disclosure into the public domain does not prejudice in some way the conduct of due process, a subsequent trial, and so on that may happen later on? Thank you. Yes. I, I thank Mr. Pereira for that question. That is, in fact, a key point. In fact, one could say that that is the key point in making a decision on going public. And uh, that is why you need to look carefully at the facts. So if you look at the facts relating to Mr. Liu and uh, the Lees, what has happened? The High Court has said that uh, in the case of Mr. Liu, perhaps in uh, less clear language, in the case of the lease, uh, very direct language, which I've taken you through, that, you know, at least uh, Mr. Liu, as well as the two lease, were not telling the truth. The investigation relates back to that very point on which the courts have taken a view as to whether they lied or didn't lie. That is why I said the prejudice is very marginal, if any. And as for the other aspect of prejudice, that people will think less well of them, the fact that we repeat in this house what the courts have already said about them is not going to increase the cloud, as it were. So these are factors in the prejudice that you should take into account, both the legal prejudice of fair trial as well as public perception prejudice, you should consider even before you release. You don't try and recover ground after that and shore up, as it were. You make these calculations before, what's the extent of prejudice? And uh, you release the information, but always bearing in mind, sometimes public interest may require disclosure, even if it means some degree of prejudice. So that's an assessment, and it's an assessment we have to make. In this case, in the case of the lease, I have explained why I think the prejudice is pretty much non-existent, because we are simply repeating what has been said, and saying that the police are investigating that matter, which everyone would expect us to do anyway, because I've said in this house, we'll investigate these matters. So what's the prejudice? But there may be other cases, potentially, where that could, the prejudice could be uh, a little bit more. So we have to assess public interest, and uh, that is why we have parliament. And if somebody takes a different view on prejudice, we'll have to answer the questions. Thank you. Ms. And, and they will obviously be entitled to their full rights to give their version of events, and they'll be entitled to uh, defend their position in court. Ms. Sylvillan. Thank you, Speaker. I have one supplementary question for the Minister um, to aid understanding of what he said earlier. Um, I think the question was posed to him by Mr. Leong about whether the police had actually issued an order to Mr. Lee Sien Yang and uh, Mrs. Lee to attend the uh, interview, and his answer was that they were emailed and they said that they would cooperate. So, so do I read from that that actually the police had not gotten to the stage when an order under the CPC Criminal Procedure Code was actually issued to them? Yes. That is right, sir. So a specific order under the CPC was not issued. The police normally would not issue such an order. They would first contact and speak with and send a written document. And if a party says that uh, they will cooperate, the police would assume in good faith that that's how they will proceed. And that is what was done. And the next thing the police heard was uh, another email from the couple saying that they will not cooperate. But by then, they were already, as I said, essentially absconded from jurisdiction. Um, I thank the minister for his reply. Um, the minister mentioned that uh, the disciplinary tribunal and the court of three judges have found them guilty of um, uh, lying in, under oath, um, but 
exactly what lies these are were not mentioned. Can the minister share with us what exactly are these lies they were found to have said? And secondly, um, <clears throat> there is much chatter uh, that the investigation and the timing of the release of this information is linked to the interview with Bloomberg where Mr Lee Hsien Yang actually said that he might consider running for president. So would the minister like to clarify on the situation? On the first point as to exactly what the lies were, I would invite the member to read the disciplinary tribunal's judgment and the court of three judges' judgment. It is also the relevant extract sign Senior Minister Teo's uh, answer as an annex. I think when we give answers in Parliament, we expect members to read them. And I don't think we want to waste Parliament's time by me going through that again. On the second point, can I invite member to make clear, is the member suggesting that uh, there is a connection between the Bloomberg interview and the disclosure in Parliament? Because we do not repeat rumors from outside. Is the member suggesting that? I would like to know that before I answer. Um, no, I'm not suggesting that, but I am aware that there are such um, speculations going on and is quite prevalent. So I'm merely asking if the minister would like to take this opportunity um, to clarify. If that is not being suggested, then I would ask, sir, through you, that the member withdraw that part of her question, and I'll answer the rest of the question. Are there further questions, Ms. Hazelpaw? There are many rumours swirling about outside on many other issues. We don't necessarily bring them in. If that is the situation, then I withdraw the question. Ms. Villain? You don't have to withdraw the question. I'll answer the question. Minister? I'm trying to now recall, but my recollection is that the Bloomberg interview came after the answer given by Senior Minister Teo. And therefore, even the prescience of this government could not have foretold that Mr. Lee Sian Yang was going to give such an interview. I stand corrected, but, but that's my recollection of the sequence of events. And if a question is asked in Parliament, we answer. The debate for us is I have explained the reasons why the answer was given. No one took issue when I disclosed that Mr. Liu was being investigated. I assume that everyone accepted the principle, and I've explained how that principle applies here. If anyone challenges us on that, I am prepared to debate. But the principle is the same. Thank you. 